I would like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Romy Amaro. She is a uh, professor and sc scholar in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. She received her PhD uh, in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, Dr. Amaro has received a number of awards, so let me mention two. Uh, the first one is the NIH New Innovator Award, and the second one is the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, she is also the lead PI of a couple of NIH projects. Her research is concerned with the development and application of state-of-the-art multi-scale computational methods to address questions in drug discovery and molecular and cellular biophysics. Uh, Dr. Amaro will talk to us about molecular simulations at the meso, meso scale. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Amaro. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. So, um, right, so I'm a domain scientist, and I'm gonna be telling you today about um, how we've been using uh, this high-performance computing to uh, advance drug discovery and molecular stimulation at the mesoscale. So, of course, uh, all of you in here are no stranger to the strangers to the tremendous growth in computing power that we've had over the past couple of decades. Um, and I'm um, just showing here sort of the tremendous rise in, uh, in compute power as a function of time for the various uh, supercomputing sites in the United States. Um, and what you can sort of see here is that um, we've been able to, or I'm going to tell you today about how we've been trying to harness this compute power to uh, uh, address really outstanding questions in computer-aided drug discovery and biomedical research, and how this enormous growth in computing power has really enabled us to um, increase the, uh, the size of the systems that we're studying, the complexity of the systems that we're studying, and sort of the faithful predictions of our methods. And uh, so, you know, the, we've we've sort of evolved over the past couple of over the past couple of decades from studying um, single protein systems to um, more complex systems with membranes. And I'll tell you uh, today, towards the end of the talk, about our efforts uh, to run simulations of a fully enveloped uh, uh, influenza virus on the Blue Water supercomputer. Um, and we're very excited about that. But I think that uh, really, again. The most, what we're very excited about is that it's really the convergence of high performance computing with uh, advances in data science uh, and data, chemical and biophysical data, that really are going to drive um, some of the uh, most important discoveries, I think, uh, in, the, in the next few years or over the next years. So, really happening at the intersection of observational and simulation sciences. And so the methods that I'm going to tell you mostly about today are basically molecular dynamic simulations. And I think a really great way to think about them is as a computational microscope. And so um, what I'm showing here is, is uh, sort of the wiggling and jiggling of atoms that are predicted by these methods. And so essentially what we're doing is crystallographers, X-ray crystallographers can um, basically, they can determine with very high precision the relative positions of atoms in these uh, biological systems that are of interest for drug discovery and for, uh, for, for many purposes. And, but what they, what they can tell us, basically, is uh, really like a Polaroid snapshot of what that system looks like. And so, um, but you can imagine, these are very highly dynamic, moving machines that are interacting with all sorts of partners inside the cell. So um, what we are doing are using molecular dynamic simulations to essentially predict how these molecules actually are moving uh, in, in their native environments. And so we're starting with the experimental data and then extending it in ways that are otherwise impossible, essentially, to, uh, to ascertain experimentally. So this is really sort of the power of the microscope. And so um, all that we're really doing is, um, again, we're sort of approximating all the atoms in our system as hard spheres. And then we define a potential function that basically uh, defines um, what we call bonded terms and non-bonded terms. Um, 
So we can uh, basically determine the forces between the atoms as we integrate Newton's equation of motion over time. And what we can do is we, so we start with a particular experimental crystal structure. We integrate one, one time step, which is fast. It's usually one to two um, femtoseconds uh, in real time, and then, um, or in biological time. And then we get another structure. We integrate again. We get another structure. We do this integration millions and billions and trillions of time steps, and we work up a dynamical trajectory of the system's motion over time. And so I'll tell you why um, that's been so exciting for us. So uh, to do that, I'll give you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about uh, P53. So for most of you, uh, if you've taken an introductory biology course, maybe you've heard about P53. It's called the guardian of the genome, and for good reason. So P53 is a molecule that basically senses cell damage. Um, which can happen in a variety of ways through things like DNA breaks, UV radiation, or stress. It senses that the cell is damaged and then upregulates a whole bunch of pathways related to programmed cell death. And, um, and so in a normal functioning cell, P53 will, uh, again, sense that the cell is damaged and, uh, and basically try to kill the cell. It turns out that in over 50% of human cancers, P53 has a single point mutation. And actually, there's a set of most predominant point mutations that I'm showing uh, in the plot in the upper, in the upper right, um, where there's a single point mutation in this molecule that basically renders it inactive. So what's happening in many human cancers is that um, P53 has one very subtle change in its structure, and then all of a sudden, it's no longer able to upregulate those pathways related to programmed cell death. So those cancerous cells basically proliferate on uh, forever. So we've been working uh, to really understand why this happens and to try to, um, to, try to develop small molecule therapeutics that will basically uh, restore activity to P53. And so what I'm showing in the lower left is actually what, uh, what's called the DNA binding domain of P53, what that protein actually looks like. That's the green little wiry image. And what you can see there are that those, the red spheres on the green string are basically indicating the different positions uh, that could be mutated. So it could be any one of those positions that are mutated that actually cause cancer. Um, and one of the interesting things about P53 is that not only does, um, uh, is it mutated, but it can also adopt a secondary mutation that actually restores its ability to function. So um, a longstanding dream of cancer biologists has been to develop small molecule anti-cancer drugs that will reactivate P53, much in the same way P53 is able to reactivate itself through these secondary missense mutations. And so there's been a number of studies showing that if you do this in, in animals, that actually, um, that, uh, actually you regress tumor growth. So it's, it's, it was shown to be a fairly uh, good drug target. So people had worked for years to try to find molecules. And after at least two decades of study, there was only a small handful of molecules that actually had been disclosed. I'm showing those sort of across the middle of the slide. Um, and one of the interesting things about them was that they knew that these molecules reactivated P53, but they couldn't actually discern the exact mechanism of why. And so these molecules actually um, are what they're, they're called covalent drugs. So they actually form a physical bond with the target um, and somehow reactivate it. And so they knew that there, that there was a physical bond happening, but they couldn't actually figure out where this bond was occurring uh, because of experimental difficulties um, in vivo. And so, um, so we, had, we, we became very interested in this protein, and we started to run these all-atom molecular dynamic simulations. These were actually run um, on the TAC supercomputer um, in Texas, and these were on Stampede. And so what you can see is basically the wiggling. What I'm showing you here is a movie of one of the outputs of these molecular dynamic simulations. You can see the wiggling and jiggling of all the atoms in the system. Um, and where I want to particularly draw your attention to is this sort of the green surface that I'm showing, right in the middle of it, is uh, one particular residue. It's called cysteine-124. And that actually um, 
So what we're doing, you can see over this uh, relatively short time scale, so that we're looking here at the predicted dynamics over across maybe 30 nanoseconds of biological time. What you can see is that that cysteine sort of moves in and out, and there are pockets that sort of change and have variable shape that are forming. And um, so what was this telling us? So we were really excited to see this because if you look at all of the experimental structure data in the protein data bank for this system, there's over 100 different structures at this point now, over 100 different x-ray structures for P P53. If you look at all of them, what you see structurally I'm showing on the left that particular area near that cysteine, the cysteine is tucked back, it's occluded from solvent, and there's no real po large pocket there where something can bind. And what we see after running just actually not even that much molecular dynamic simulations, what we see is actually a large pocket opening up near that cysteine. The cysteine actually exposes itself to solvent and a pocket opens up. So we see this new site. We then can use other algorithms, like something called computational solvent mapping, where we can take the structures, either experimental structures or structures derived from these simulations, and basically flood these structures, the surface of these structures, with different organic probes. And then we can evaluate the interaction energy of these probes with the surface of the protein to try to predict where might drug molecules actually prefer to bind. And so, um, so we found this new site. We ran this predictive algorithm and found that um, actually this new site seemed to be possibly druggable. That's what those gray spheres were telling us. And then we did small molecule docking campaigns against this site, and we actually were able to discover small molecules uh, that would fit inside. So our sort of workflow is uh, shown, is depicted on the left here. We basically took this open structure and um, docked. We use uh, uh, small molecule docking, which is basically sort of like playing a game of Tetris with these small molecules. We're evaluating fit and interaction uh, uh, using sort of basic physics terms, just assessing the interaction of these small molecules with the, uh, with the drug target. And, um, and then we passed a predicted set of compounds to our experimental collaborators. So why would we want to do this? One of the reasons, well, one of the reasons, is, as, as I'll tell you about, is we were excited about this new site, which no one had ever seen before. But the other reason is that it takes a lot of time and work to uh, evaluate and test these compounds biologically and biochemically. So instead of having, the, one of the advantages of this approach is that instead of our collaborators having to test 2,000 compounds, we actually gave them two dozen compounds, and we found out of that relatively small set, we found one compound called stictic acid. It was a novel reactivation compound that showed dose-dependent rescue in mammalian cancer cells. And at the same time, we also, our collaborators, tested our prediction uh, sort of more carefully by mutating this particular cysteine. And we actually showed that one of the comp that the compounds that they had previously disclosed, um, that actually we figured out how it worked. We were able to rationalize its mechanism of action. Those reactivation compounds actually were acting at that cysteine 124 where we had seen, uh, where we had seen that, um, that, that movement and that new pocket open. So um, those compounds that were previously discovered by, uh, by, other, by other scientists have since moved on to clinical trials. This is being developed by a company called Aprea. And um, one of the reasons why this is so important is because they've been able to show, uh, uh, indicate efficacy in some of, in treating cancers that are platinum, cisplatin resistant. So these are some of the most difficult cancers to treat. And more recently, actually, it looks like they're moving into um, uh, a different stage of, the, of clinical trials, which is quite exciting. Um, so we saw this new, but when we saw this new pocket and we got this sort of proof of principle result and we were able to rationalize that um, the clinical trial compound, we thought maybe there's a chance we can develop even better compounds. And so we significantly expanded our approach. We're now, uh, they, we docked instead of just a couple thousand compounds, hundreds of, uh, or uh, m multiple millions of compounds to try to um, uh, develop uh, more potential drug molecules that could be eventually taken to the clinic. 
And so, um, so actually, I'm required to tell you that I'm co-founder of, on the Scientific Advisory Board of, and have equity interest in Actavalon Incorporated, which is a, a biotech company in San Diego, situated now at J Labs, that it has, uh, is trying to translate these discoveries and move them to the clinic. One of the things that I just want to point out, which is so cool, we now have multiple dozens of compounds that are reactivating. These are actually, we both have covalent compounds, which are binding onto the target, as well as sort of more standard drug-like molecules that are non-covalent. But really, sort of what I wanted to uh, lay out was the idea that um, sort of the power of a good model, and of a, in, in this case, that was really driven by the discoveries that we made using high-performance computing. So that once we had this discovery of this novel site, in six months, we were able to develop many more compounds uh, and discover many more compounds than had been, uh, that had been known uh, or discovered in the research efforts of all the previous 20 years combined. So that was quite exciting. But of course, um, uh, it's, it's great that we were able to do this, and I'm really enthusiastic about the work that's going on, continues in our lab and also at Ectamelon. But the truth is that cancer is a huge, uh, a huge challenge uh, for, for humanity. And um, if you live in the United States, you have a one in three chance of being diagnosed with cancer in your lifetime. So uh, we were fortunate to receive um, an award from the NVIDIA Compute the Cure Foundation to try to develop software that would take the kinds of methods that we developed, uh, that we developed and actually make it easier for others to also harness this compute power with their own drug target. So it's not enough that we're just going after P53. We really need to have a very aggressive campaign against many different aspects of cancer. And so we partnered um, with developers of the Kepler workflow framework to develop a tool that basically helps simplify the very complex end-to-end -end experimental workflow of uh, drug discovery that I just told you about, encode that into an automated framework uh, that allowed us to increase reuse, uh, really um, get, uh, really sort of um, address challenges in reproducibility, and also scale execution uh, for us. And so actually earlier this year, a few months ago, um, we made available this tool to the community um, and it allows, it has a lot of nice features, including um, a user MD parameter configuration option. You can run this, um, and I think one of the most powerful parts of this uh, is not only that it helps encode this, this, this complex 100-step workflow for other scientists who are interested to use it, but also that it's able to, um, to take advantage in a sort of versatile and flexible uh, and straightforward way of uh, uh, heterogeneous compute resources. So it's very easy for domain scientists to basically toggle the jobs back and forth between their local clusters, exceed clusters, and, and also in the cloud. And so um, that's something that um, we're excited about having launched. And so then in the last, in the second part of my talk, so that's what we've been able to do with uh, single, with systems that are, I would say, relatively small. So sort of like looking at single drug targets. And that's been powerful, as I've showed. But what we're really excited about, especially coming off of hearing the last talk, um, we have these really, you know, how are we really going to harness the at the sort of the bleeding edge, at the frontier edge of computing, what can we do with this? And so it's not just computing power, but it's also data, biomedical data, and in particular, biomedical structural data that gets us very excited. So we have, what I'm showing here is basically a scale of uh, biological 3D structural data that we're trying to use to develop 3D models of subcellular environments and ultimately cells. So to develop what we call visible virtual cells. And so we can take data at the smallest scale from electron crystallography, which gives us very, very high resolution uh, uh, information about the relative position of the atoms in our structure. At the next level, and I'm sure many of you guys have heard of it, just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, cryo-electron microscopy. So owing to uh, tremendous advances in direct detector technologies, we now can get near atomic resolution with those methods for not just single proteins, but actually macromolecular assemblies. There are approaches like electron tomography, which basically also allow us to look at subcellular environments and cellular environments. 
And, that, and then actually moving even farther out, we want to understand how these macromolecular assemblies are situated inside their nano neighborhoods. And at the farthest end, um, we can actually look at tissue, uh, tissue samples that are basically embedded in epoxy resin so that we can understand how all of these microenvironments are actually built into cells and how cells sort of are um, integ integrated into these ecosystem-like communities of tissues. And so we, can, we have, across this whole spectrum, we're moving from sort of the small structure to the, to the, large, the large end of structure, so looking at cells and tissues and trying to understand how these all sort of come together. So computationally, what this means is that we need to develop better tools that allow us to integrate all of this data and to take advantage of it um, in ways that haven't been done before. And so we're very interested, and we've been working towards extending molecular structure to cellular environments. One of the tools that we've been using and developing, actually, to do this is something called CellPack. What CellPack allows us to do is to take, uh, to define geometries, or what we call surface containers, from data like tomography. And then basically, if we know the different molecular ingredients that are supposed to be in that system, we can then pack, we can use CellPack to um, constrain the system and pack all of these different high resolution pieces into this larger scale system. So what this allows really for the first time is a highly detailed three-dimensional reconstruction of biological systems uh, at the mesoscale. So CellPack, again, <clears throat> is really a cell-centered, data-centric modeling framework. It ingests not only structural data, but also data from uh, from uh, fluorescence, from proteomics, and basically essentially any input data that you can use an input as a constraint. You can then define these different compartments and have different ingredients from different compartments with different constraints, and then it will basically build not just one model, but sets of models. Uh, for you that have this really never before seen complexity uh, with atomic resolution. And why this is important is that it used to be that even to build a single system of this scale with this level of detail, it might take, some, it might take a team, a research team, maybe three or four years. What we can do now is with this tool, um, we can actually create not just one model, but multiple models that actually are consistent with the whole set of constraint data. Um, and so this, I, this is going to, uh, we anticipate, be very helpful for trying to deal with and get a grasp on uh, biological heterogeneity. So we want to build these systems. Um, we also want to uh, bring them to life with simulation. And actually, CellPack was a tool that was developed initially for graphics and for visualization. So many of you, or some of you might know the, um, the beautiful pictures that David Goodsell draws at, at Scripps Research Institute, sort of showcasing really the, the beautiful complexity of cells. We want to take these images and really move them beyond video games to actually have predictive physics under the hood, so we can actually make discoveries that uh, you know, will, um, will address these uh, pressing needs in biomedical research. So in order to, um, to do that, to bring these large-scale systems to life, essentially with simulation, um, we have to develop a lot of other tools, like for example, how do we build and construct these atomistic lipid membranes that have variable composition like they do in human cells? How can we do that um, robustly and routinely? And so we developed a tool called Lipid Wrapper where we can basically take the data from the tomography and, um, and uh, use it to define where the membranes will be. And then we tessellate the surface, position these pre-equilibrated pre lipid slabs into the surface, and then can sort of work out all the different kinks that one encounters um, when you're trying to actually do atomic scale simulation. And so, um, so we were able to uh, build and simulate um, the, uh, the flu virus. So we worked together with Alastair Stephen at the, at the National Institutes of Health, who had beautiful tomography data. And um, what we've been able to do is take the, uh, the tomography images that he, um, that he showed us and use them to reconstruct these accurate uh, three-dimensional models of the influenza virus. And so what I'm showing here actually is, um, uh, is sort of the results of work 
that was only possible through um, not only uh, the, the tremendous team at Blue Waters, who obviously worked very hard to build um, the system, but also thanks to the NAMD team. So we've been using what I'm, this dynamics uh, that I'm showing you is actually um, of using uh, the NAMD2 molecular dynamics code uh, to actually uh, look at the system uh, at scale. And so this biological system, so I'm not showing you all of the waters that are also there. This viral system has approximately 160 million atoms in it. Um, and so I'm, we're, tr we're translating, uh, I'm sort of rotating and translating the system, but you can see, especially as we zoom back out here in a moment, you can see the sort of the small scale wiggling and jiggling of the atoms, that's actually the wiggling and jiggling of the atoms that, that is predicted from the molecular dynamic simulation. Um, and so why do we want to do this? Uh, that's actually something that uh, I found in some sense surprising um, how hard you have to argue for, for building these large scale systems. Um, but one of the things that uh, immediately becomes apparent is that you can study, we can study, and researchers have studied the, the, these systems on the sort of single protein scale, on the small scale. But what you, you can't appreciate is, is when you actually put the whole, all these little pieces together into the whole, you can learn new things that you, and, and have new hypotheses that you couldn't necessarily have even imagined when you were just studying the single protein system on its own. And so, um, so, uh, so we actually had studied for many years, actually. We had, we had been one of those teams studying the, um, the single proteins sort of in isolation from each other. And um, what, one of the things that we discovered from this large scale simulation uh, was that uh, the dynamics of these proteins in the packed, crowded environment of the virus actually makes a difference. And so, um, uh, what I'm showing here is basically what it's a, it's a plot of the principal components of uh, the structural dynamics that are sampled in different systems. So I'm comparing in the leftmost, so the, the, there's two, the two major glycoproteins are those surface, uh, the surface spikes sticking out from the flu. One was neuraminidase and the other was hemagglutinin. Um, I'm showing in the single copy simulations, I'm showing sort of the principal component space that they sampled. And on the right two, the, the, the second and the third, um, uh, areas there, what I'm showing is basically what, what the principal components look like sampled in the virus itself. And basically what this is indicating to us is that there is some shared space of the structural ensemble of these systems, but actually uh, there's some that are also quite different. And so, um, so that's great. So one of the, the major criticisms also was you're going to build this huge system. It's going to take you, you know, a year to build it, a year to simulate it, and then what are you going to learn? So we learned that actually the dynamics are different, but something else that we didn't anticipate at the time, which is really uh, one of sort of the game changers, I think, for molecular simulation at this, uh, at this next scale, is that we can use powerful data analysis approaches, statistics-based data analysis approaches, to, uh, to dissect, to essentially deconstruct our model. So we can use Markov state model theory to um, to basically what we do is we extract each of these different, because we have so many copies of, the, uh, of each of these biological entities in this complex scene, we can actually uh, treat each of them independently and then stitch together uh, their dynamics and their, their structural dynamics into uh, a network of states. So these Markov state models allow us to define metastable states and then the transitions between the states. And why this is powerful is because it allows us to extract long time scale dynamics from short time scale simulations. And so, um, so when we were running those, the, 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 the virus simulation on Blue Waters, um, uh, we were able to get about 100, I think about 160 nanoseconds of simulation for this 160 million atom system, which isn't very much. But through the power of Markov state model theory, the dynamics that we can actually uh, extract out for these systems is actually much larger, or it can get to much longer. So why do we care? Well, it turns out for, um, for these flu targets, so one of them is actually called neuraminidase, and I'm showing, that to you, I'm showing it to you on the left. 
um, you might, that little molecule there in the center is um, Tamiflu. So some of you may have heard of Tamiflu, maybe even taken it. It's, one of, it's the, the only orally available flu drug uh, that, that is available for, for use. Um, and so there's been, um, there's right adjacent or underneath where the drug molecule sits, there's this, what they call the 150 loop, and another loop adjacent to that called the, one, the 430 loop. And basically what we see is um, that in some influenza strains, that loop is open and uh, that loop is closed, and in other influenza strains, that loop is open. And when it's open, there, one could consider, and people have been working to try to develop drugs that would basically extend down into that open area. So what we were able to do using these large-scale simulations through Markov state models, because there were so many different copies of the biological system in this scene, we were able to use Markov state models to basically rigorously characterize the kinetics of the loop opening and closing motion, um, which had never, been, had never been quantified before and would be very difficult to quantify experimentally. And what we also, uh, what we also showed, which I'm indicating on the right, is basically, um, so if you look at the, the green blob at the bottom, that's what the crystal structure of neuraminidase looks like from the side view. Um, so this is the static Polaroid snapshot that we get from the experimentalist. And you can see the silver balls that are, sort of, that are indicated there. That's actually highlighting where the druggable pockets are. If you look at the picture immediately above it, you can see how that pocket is much more sort of deeply invaginated. There's really a crevice there, and it really has changed structurally. So these simulations for this other target have also yielded these novel druggable sites that we are um, now continuing to go after. But it's not just, it's not that we want to use molecular dynamics um, uh, for every single system of this size, uh, because maybe you're not interested to know the wiggling and jiggling of every single atom in your system. Once we go through the, 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 the exercise of actually building these large-scale systems, we can use other types of physics approaches, like Brownian dynamic simulations, to investigate other types of questions. So in Brownian dynamic simulations, we basically don't have any internal degrees of freedom. So it's basically looking at rigid body diffusion of, for example, a drug molecule trying to find its way to where it's actually going to bind and act in the flu virus. It actually diffuses through a continuum solvent that has a particular viscosity and dielectric constant. And, um, and then can, we can actually use these simulations to figure out how these drug molecules are actually sort of finding their way to the sites where they might bind. And if you look, in the, again, in the upper right there, highlighted sort of in blue, it turns out that um, the drug molecules, as well as the host cell receptors that bind to neuraminidase, they can bind to more than just one site. And so what this allows us to do is really look at how these molecules approach their target and what other options are available for them for binding. And um, it's really sort of, it's a multi-scale approach because we can actually, uh, the, the, the scale that we're looking at goes from hundreds of nanometers down to angstrom level distances in the end when these molecules actually bind. And so what we found in the case of the flu, and actually this was not work carried out on Blue Waters, but actually work carried out on the Comet supercomputer using um, a tool called brown dye that we develop at uh, the P41 Center I direct. What we were able to do is actually to create multiple strains of the influenza virus that actually replicated um, four different strains, um, two that are found in wild, that actually have been found in clinical isolates. So that's the 2009 swine flu strain, as well as the uh, 2004 bird flu strain, and, um, and then two lab-created strains. And we're actually able to investigate different properties. So why this is cool, this is basically sort of leading us towards a virtual lab for um, some of these experiments, which uh, can actually be quite controversial because it's possible that in some cases, um, and I'm sure actually some of you might remember this, uh, they actually were making mutations to particular strains of the flu that if those strains escaped out of the lab could have potentially caused great damage. So I think that, you know, looking forward, this supercomputers, uh, certainly high performance computing is definitely going to enable us to develop really virtualized labs for, um, for these systems. So why did we care about this for the flu? 
Well, it turns out that some of the most virulent strains, like the bird flu, which, by the way, if you catch, is generally very bad news. It has a very high probability that you're, it's difficult to catch, but if you catch it, it's a very high probability that um, things are not going to go well for you, uh, of fatality. Um, so it turns out that the bird flu actually has a deletion, what's called a deletion, in one of, their, in one of these proteins, um, the neuraminidase protein. So if you look at, on the two bottom panels, I'm showing a slice through, these, through two of the viruses that we made. And you can see the blue spike proteins. If you look at the left panel, you see the blue spike proteins. Those are the hemagglutinins. And the white spike protein that looks like broccoli, that's the neuraminidase. Um, you see one sort of configuration there. And if you compare that to the, to the image on the right, you can see that the, the green is very similar to the blue. But what's different is the height of, that, of, that, of the broccoli protein or of the neuraminidase protein. And why that matters, that's one of the questions that we can, we could, we're trying to ask. So we can use these computational models, which um, have never existed before at this scale, to, to, to try to understand what happens to drug binding and viral binding to the host cell when it has this, um, this stock deletion. So when this important protein that's required for binding and release of these viruses you know, what, what's, what are the things that happen um, actually with, at the molecular level um, when we see this? And so <clears throat> one of the exciting things that, we, um, that we've recently discovered is that science, there's been sort of a mysterious secondary binding site on the broccoli-like protein, on the neuraminidase protein. It's outside of where Tamiflu and the drug molecules bind, but it's near there. People have known about it for a long time, but really questioned why this site exists and what is, what is it doing. Well, these simulations have shown for the first time that, it, that this secondary site actually seems to play an unexpected role in binding of these host cell receptors. And um, why that's interesting is because it appears that it's the balance of, of the binding activities between these two different proteins, so between the hemagglutin and the neuraminidase proteins, that's actually linked to transmissibility of the flu. So this is just one example of the kind of uh, information that we're actually able to extract and dig out from these, uh, from these large scale systems. OK. And so, um, so hopefully what I've shown you at this point is um, how we've really been able to sort of use high performance computing and some of the largest, not just some of the largest architectures like Blue Waters, which have been fantastic um, for these really, really massively parallelizable uh, molecular dynamic simulation runs, but also um, how we can harness and use the exceed architectures uh, to, uh, to, uh, to discover novel druggable binding sites. But one of the things that, you know, looking forward, we're really most excited about is the continued growth of compute power and in the development of tools that will allow us to use that uh, compute power in ways that will really affect biomedical research and, and human health. And so even in the past five years, I just want to close here with this slide, that we've gone from studying systems on the order of 10 nanometers, so this single protein system, as I'm showing on the left, to being able to build faithfully build and simulate uh, a fully enveloped influenza virus, which is now um, 100 to 120 nanometers in diameter. And looking forward, we now have models, molecular scale models, of much larger systems that are on the order of a micron or more uh, that have molecular or atomic level detail. And that's a picture of, uh, of a dendritic spine, of the actin gel within a dendritic spine drawn to molecular detail. So we are, I would say, uh, already ready for exascale and, and, and the next machines, and really excited also to, to use those. So um, just in closing, in my acknowledgment slide, I have a terrific lab. I'd like to thank, of course, um, all of the, the, the high performance compute sites uh, that we've used over the years, which have been a number, including uh, TAC, Stampede, including Comet, SDSC Comet, and also, of course, Blue Waters for these really massively parallelized runs, uh, which is sort of a very special kind of simulation. Um, also thank NVIDIA for, and their foundation there for the Compute the Cure Award. And um, a special shout out, of course, to Klaus Schulten. So many of you uh, probably were familiar with Klaus Schulten, who was one of the pioneers for these large scale models uh, and for, um, for developing software that works so beautifully for so many on these architectures. Uh, 
And I meant to mention earlier, of course, that his team um, uh, has won the, the Gordon Bell Award, also the Sidney Fernbach Award. So they've really been uh, tremendous. And his passing last year was a, a big loss to everyone. But uh, his legacy will live on most certainly through, through our work and through the work of all of you. So in closing, um, we're going, I'm going to go head over to the, I am from California, so I'm from the University of California, San Diego. So I'll be hanging out with the folks at the SDSC booth after this if you'd like to continue the conversation. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. Again, uh, please come up to the, to the mic. Uh, number one. So, so this is really exciting. Thank you. It's wonderful to see this, how you're exploring functionalizing surface for drug delivery. Because probably there's about 12 people in the audience that are going to directly benefit from it. So this is great. Um, so for decades, scientists have not really been a proactive, uh, self-advocating voice in public policy. And we have various advocacy groups that are now taking position against animal research. So do you think we're going to approach a time when we could eliminate or dramatically reduce um, research on animals or clinical trials? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I, and, I, and as yeah. a follow-up to that, um, what are the challenges in, in getting greater detail on functionalizing surfaces? Okay. So, I mean, I, of course, I'm a, I'm a strong believer that uh, computation will continue to uh, to rise and, and overtake even, I think, some aspects of experimental science. Of course, we're never going to be able to get rid of clinical trials, but we can make them more effective and more predictive, make them faster and better. Um, and then the second question, uh, in terms of challenges for trying to functionalize these surfaces, you mean in, in terms of the modeling of that? Is that what you mean? Yeah, so definitely there's a lot. So. Um, and I didn't show any of the force field equations or anything because I figured that was going to be too detailed. Uh, but there's a lot of work that goes into uh, and a lot of challenges that remain for folks who are interested to, uh, to predict the free energy of binding of drug molecules or you know, of interacting partners to particular sites. A lot of that has to do with force field development. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's. That's really sort of the main, I mean, for methods of this type and of, of this regime, that's probably some of the, the main challenges. OK, let's take one more question at mic number two. Hi, uh, my name is Tarek Malas. Uh, thank you for the very inspiring talk. Um, uh, given the, uh, uh, accelera this acceleration in drug discovery through the power co of the computing, mm -hmm. does this drive down the cost of developing new drugs significantly? And do you envision any impact of this on the drug prices or medicine prices in the near or long future? Yeah, um, I don't know. So it will, these methods are uh, in fact already being used in, uh, in many different pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies to try to make better drugs faster through the process of lead optimization. And actually something that I didn't really touch on very much was the, um, the porting of these simulation and drug discovery approaches to GPU architectures has been really key uh, in, in advancing the timelines so um, to make it fast enough for these methods to be predictably used actually in pharma companies. And so they're investing like crazy in, this, in these uh, approaches and architectures. Um, but uh, so yes, I think that they are going to help. I mean, there's still a lot of work that we need to do, but uh, they're being actively used even today. Um, and but you know, with regard to whether or not the prices will be lower, I probably can't comment on that. I'm not sure if they would uh, drop the prices or just make more profit. <laughs> okay, so let's thanks uh, Rami and also uh, Alwan in your time. <laughs>